Hey, what's up, everybody? This podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get yourself a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Courtney Diamond. I'm currently listening to How to Talk to Anyone, 92 Little Tricks for Big Success in Relationships by Leal Loundis? Lounds. Loundis. We're going to go with Loundis. I'm going to say that's what it is. But feel free to grab yourself any audiobook of your choice for free and that 30-day free trial by going to audibletrial.com slash Courtney Diamond. Now for this week's podcast, I sat down for a chat with an SDSU professor with a PhD in rhetoric. We talk about vulnerability, writing, and the importance of knowing yourself, among other things. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this conversation I had with Dr. Paul Minifee. Let's start with this. You sent me that Know Yourself clip that you did when you spoke to all of those people. Was that a, a frat? Yes, Sigma Phi Beta. They're, they're called the Sigmas. It's a historically black fraternity. What was it that <clears throat> inspired that talk, or what made you want to start getting to know yourself better? Well, the Sigmas, uh, they actually posed the theme. So my task was to talk from a personal slash professional perspective on the theme of Know Yourself. So I decided to go more of the testimonial route, and that was challenging mostly because uh, I would be a lot more vulnerable with them than I usually am. The vulnerability thing, that's kind of where my blog came from and kind of what started this podcast idea is because I got to a point where I was... I felt like I was incapable of being vulnerable Mm. and I had to work my way out of that. Mm -hmm. So that was a long series of events. I sympathize with that. Yeah. When I heard your social anxiety podcast, that's when I could feel that you were stepping out there. Yeah. And it's been a long, it's been a longer process too, you know, Mm -hmm. and I feel like you have to get to this point where you realize if you're not willing to be vulnerable, how will you get to know anybody? How will you let anybody see who you really are? Right. And where the the blog stemmed from, really, was me getting to this point where I was bummed out enough because I was so disconnected from other people. I did not know how to express myself to anybody anymore for some reason. I had to figure out how to get out of it. And I was like, why do I feel trapped Mm -hmm. in myself? Mm -hmm. So I said, who can I talk to? I feel like I can't talk to anybody. I decided to talk to myself. (laughs) <laughs> oh. So I said, I'll talk to myself. If mm-hmm. I feel like I can't express myself to anybody, what do I do? I start writing. You're talking my language now. Yeah. I started writing everything that was in my head on a page because I have the safety to know I can delete it and that nobody will ever see it. Now, were you doing it by hand or typing it? I was typing it. I like handwriting, but on the same token, my brain moves faster than my hand. Yeah, yeah. So typing is actually more convenient in mm-hmm. that sense, right? Mm-hmm. So I started doing that. I could start to see where I really was and start asking mm-hmm. myself why yeah. and identifying the fact that I had a huge problem with vulnerability mm. because I was ashamed of it. And I got very fortunate and I saw uh, the TED talk that Brene Brown oh, Brene did Brown. Yeah. on vulnerability, yeah. just just kind of by happenstance on Facebook. So it feels like self-awareness mm-hmm. is really the beginning of that journey of kind of solving these things that we have for ourselves where we, where we feel trapped. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it seemed like you were talking about in that. And if I had had more time, I would have uh, shared the journey that's similar to yours. Journaling really, I would say, saved a lot of my um, years of uh, high school fightings at sort of insecurities and maybe even depression. It was the vehicle for me to sort of dive into those uncomfortable spaces in my psyche and in my history. And... It's basically the reason I wanted to study psychology in college. I wanted to study narrative therapy. And so I would encourage you to try handwriting it, even though it's cumbersome, not as convenient. Interesting. How does that work? It's the body. It's the physical act of writing those thoughts down. It's even the ache in your hand, the tension in your hand, the sweat in your palms. It's that attachment to the instrument which is touching the paper, which is bleeding the ink, that all is not just sort of poetic and symbolic, but that physical connection to your emotions is apparently, some research shows, a deeper way to connect yourself with those experiences. 
and what I studied in my master's program was uh, what's exactly happening with narrative therapy? How does that really work? And when you're writing about trauma, for example, you're the author and each word that you use to encapsulate that experience makes you the person who's in power. So instead of that traumatic experience, which was overwhelming or it might still be overwhelming and feels like it's controlling you and dominating you, now you have the power through the pen to circumscribe it, to uh, even imprison it. And now you're in control. And what some psychiatrists and psychologists do is they say, well, why don't you rewrite the narrative in the way that you would want it to end? And so, for example, victims of sexual assault, rape, they change the narrative. And they're the ones who are in control and instead of the ones being powerless. So I, I, what I ended up doing was journaling, just fleshing it all out, just exactly how it happened and then like you were saying, going back and analyzing the whys, the hows, mm-hmm. and then looking at myself like, okay, th- there's a pattern here. And this yeah. is why I was mentioning early the Mind Over Mood book, because it has charts that you fill out where you start to see, well, when I'm in this circumstance, I generally think this thought, and as a consequence, I feel this feeling, and that feeling provokes this behavior. Have it's, you seen Inside Out, the mm-mm. movie? No. It actually tells you a lot of great things that are related to this topic. The one scene I can describe, so Riley, she's this young girl, and the movie is really about the five emotions that occupy her thought world and brain. And the two main characters are joy and sadness. And there's a scene where sadness sits with Riley's old imaginary friend called Bing Bong. And Bing Bong is critical to them getting out of this predicament that they're in. And Joy's in a hurry to get back to solve the issue to, to, to make Riley happy again. And Sadness sits with Bing Bong and makes him cry, which frustrates Joy because Joy is all about keeping Riley happy. But when Sadness sits with Bing Bong and helps him produce those tears, and he cries, he lets it all out, they sit with it. And she's patient with him. He moves on. He gets over it. And he says, okay, I feel better now. Let's go. Here's where we're supposed to go. And Joy has this epiphany and was like, oh my gosh, sadness is essential to Riley's overall well-being. And so she realizes later that all of those bad instances that Riley had suffered weren't always things that needed to be squashed, but things that needed to be revisited. Processed. Processed. That makes total sense. I feel like the lack of processing is what gets you all worked up and built up and when you feel like you can't handle things and you it leads to that feeling of constant anxiety mm. is when you don't process those things right i do recognize the importance of processing things now i think i still wait for my own moment i think i still wait to kind of do it in my own place sure but yeah so they asked you to talk about that like did you have to go into your own personal life and look at your own self what oh, did you absolutely what did you come to with that absolutely so a number of them knew that in my classes, I ask my students to do what Brene Brown basically challenges and encourages all to do, and that is to to be more vulnerable. So the final essay in two of my classes are um, rhetorical autobiographies. So they have to find a specific audience that is either experiencing the trauma or crisis that the writer has already, you know, overcome, or they're on their way to, you know, encountering that that crisis, that crossroads. And so the essay is is about what mechanisms or strategies that they use to cope with it or overcome it or endure it and not strong arm the audience to say, well, you got to do it my way, but simply to offer their experience as a, as one way that could help, but largely to draw that empathy to say here, I overcame my addiction to cocaine or here I eventually became well after being sexually assaulted. Um, most of them are about being the, the children of divorced parents. And then another quarter are about battles with mental illness, largely anxiety, depression, uh, those two for sure. Here's the quarter of each class right yeah, about that. That's crazy. Yeah. So knowing that the students who asked me to give the talk said, okay, well, surely you know, Dr. Paul is willing to practice what he preaches. So he should talk about his own 
journey to knowing himself, which might involve talking about some of those flaws and low points. And uh, as you heard, I took that challenge. And it was it was hard because th- those weren't my students. Those were people from the community. And I was like, whoa, this yeah. is now public and not my safe space of the classroom that I, you know, spent a lot of time, you know, creating that safe space in, in this little space. But on the stage in front of 250 people that I don't know. Mm. It's a little different. That was different. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little different. Was it a relief afterwards? It, How did you it, feel about it? it? It was liberating. I mean, I wrote it out. And even as I wrote it out, I was like, am I really going to say this? Because I knew that my parents were going to be watching. I knew that my pastors were going to be watching. Um, and after the words came out, and you saw at the end, my closest friends in San Diego were right there. And I knew that they would feel triumphant with me, you know, because they're the ones who've been listening to me share these saying, you know, these secrets with them, but to be as, you know, Dr. Brown said that vulnerable would be that much more courageous and that much more, you know, liberated. Uh, and the relief did come. But doesn't it seem like when you share those type of things, really what happens is that people come forward and they can, and they relate. Yes. They can relate to you. So via Facebook, my friends from high school, uh, wrote me and said that, uh, you know, I thought I knew you because we, some of them I've known since elementary school, but I've certainly never known you as well as I do now. And my own brother, who's 26 now, he said the same thing. He said, in 15 minutes, I learned more about you than I have in 26 years. I was like, whoa. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. But it's kind of nice to be known, I think. And, and they also said they felt encouraged to now share with their parents or their friends or their yeah. loved ones. Um, you, do you feel that sometimes when you share more that the other person will reciprocate mm-hmm. and then the bond can deepen? Yeah. Even if just one person steps a little bit outside of that, it's like, that's who, that's how you create those deep friendships, even mm-hmm. the person that you share that emotion with. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a very cool thing. Um, you sent me, you sent me the thing that said, who makes you better? Right. I forgot that I sent you that. Yeah. Yeah. And I tried to answer those questions. And I realized Mm. that my world is small. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Is my world supposed to be small when it comes to the people that I confide in? I won't say supposed to be or not. You know, if you have a loyal six people, you know, that fit those roles, then... Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have six people. Or if there's three and three of them occupy two different roles, that's also fine. We go through it for some of the people that don't know what we're talking about. So you ask, who is your comforter, your confronter, your challenger, counselor, co-benefactor, and celebrator? Mm-hmm. And we have to give credit to Dr. Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley. This is based on his sermon. Interesting. Mm-hmm. But I was going through these, these different things and trying to put a person in there, and I realized I probably only have maybe three, mm. maybe three people. And some of them, some of these, these different roles... I'm like, I think I'm, it's just me that I choose to turn to <laughs> rather than other people. Oh, we got to work on that, Courtney. You know, and it's yeah. not the, it's not in a sense that I don't think that there's people I could turn to. I just, it made me realize that maybe I keep certain things still very much to myself. Mm. Do you feel when you go through this process and looking to see who fills these roles, do you have different people for each of these? Mm-hmm. Um, I would say the most difficult one to fill is confronter because that is the person who, uh, as I said to a group of students recently, that person needs to be in proximity to you. It can't be someone in Idaho or in India okay. because that person might have to actually stop you in your tracks on your way to do the thing that <laughs> <laughs> will lead to your demise. On the way to you being a wreck. Right. Um. <laughs> right. Physically accost you. <laughs> yeah. So it's the person that just to define it, it's the person that calls you out. Well, calls you out show, by, right? by confront, like physically. Knows your bad habits. Yes, yes. Will stop you from doing things that they know yeah. is not necessarily the healthiest. That would make sense that they have to be near you. So I'll, I'll give you an example of um, that my, uh, the sorority, so I advise the sorority at San Diego State, um, mm-hmm. Pi Beta Phi. And um, one of the girls said that, okay, uh, my confronter is the friend of mine 
who stops me when I've been drinking a lot from going to that guy's house. Doesn't everybody need that person? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, and we're, not, we're just going to make lots of assumptions about what could happen, but sure. But that's but that's that a very things. relevant thing. Yeah. That a lot of people that are single. Yeah. I I would say young, but I mean, I guess it could be anybody. So that's that's the difficult job of a confronter. Now, who is willing to be that type of friend? Is someone who doesn't have that same weakness generally. Because there are friends who would say the exact, oh, go girl, he's so cute, you know? Yeah, who cares? Yeah, who cares? You know, oh, oh go get it, girl, you know, just encourages you actually mm -hmm. to do that. The counselor needs to be someone who knows the general way that you perceive things. So when you tell a story, uh, and maybe, I, and let's say I was, let's say I, I'm your counselor, let's say I'm your friend, uh, and I was there when this episode happened. And you're now retelling the story from your perspective. And I say, okay, Courtney, I, um, I feel where you're coming from. But your perception of that situation is skewed. Let me give you the objective reality of what happened. Because you're caught up in your emotions. And the way you saw that and experienced it. And I want to validate you because, you know, perception is powerful. Uh, sure. And I think people need to feel validated almost to take the advice. Right. And I have to set you straight. So they recalibrate our skewed perceptions of experiences. Yeah. So they're people you have to learn to be very honest with. Yes. And also they can probably recognize the little cues in you, mm -hmm. little things you're doing where they can call you out and be like, hey, you're doing it again. Right. I guess that's that's why I realized that my group is very small. There's very few people that I let have that in to myself. I guess you're fortunate. You have a different person for each of those different roles. If I were to write them down, I might not have a different person for every single one of them. And so I, I recently told a group of students, they asked me, you know, where are they? And so uh, I wrote down the ones that are here in San Diego because I, you know, got to practice what I preach. And I said something about proximity, uh, especially when it comes to confronter and challenger and also comforter. You know, you want someone to whose shoulder you're going to cry on, hopefully it's someone within a 50 mile radius. You know, It's helpful. It's helpful. But uh, it would be great if I could see that person face to face contact and, you know, and even affection, a hug that's powerful. But what I also recognize is that if you keep the people that are, you know, far away, you don't learn how to build your nest of role players in your in your local space and again you're you're likely to sort of fall into old habits so accountability i still think is best when structured around proximity that makes sense do you have to share your bad habits specifically with these people mm -hmm. or hey, look or, out i do this stop me <laughs> or they'll just notice over time I, my friends who are very observant they say paul I, I notice you do this a lot you know have you ever thought about why you do that or thought about stopping that. <laughs> it's a very powerful thing to stop and ask yourself why about all types of things that you do. Mm -hmm. And then really get to the root of it. That's a huge thing because that's almost a great way to interrupt the pattern is just to recognize where it came from mm -hmm. in the first place. Yeah. You were telling me um, before that you go on these retreats. So this past weekend, um, San Diego State, the student life and leadership portion of Associated Students they host a leadership camp. It's called Aztec Core, and there's two parts that, or two different camps that are, that are there at the same time. And we were in Palomar Mountain, by the way. One was called the Inclusion Diversity Camp, and the other one is just a regular leadership camp. And so I was facilitating, co-facilitating the leadership camp. So uh, I begin by saying, I hold up a hammer, and I just sort of hold it up, you know, make it obvious that it's a hammer. And I even asked the, of course, rhetorical question, you know, what is this? I say, yes, it's a hammer, but it's a two and a half million year old instrument. Two and a half million years. It's one of the few instruments or tools that has not changed in its design. So I said, I want you to think of yourself as someone who was created for a particular purpose. The inventor, the creator of the hammer, apparently got it right the first time that it's endured two and a half million years. And that designer had a particular purpose for it. And when you look at a hammer, it has a body. It has 
uh, a neck, it has a, a head, it has a face, it has cheeks, it has a face and, and tongs. And each part is designed to be used efficiently for those purposes. And so I asked the students, I said, okay, what are your virtues? Now, I don't mean moral excellence type virtues, but I mean virtues in a sense of qualities of uh, efficiency and excellence. So the virtue of uh, this chair is that it's, it's comfortable to sit in. The virtues of certain things make it easier to use them. So the virtue of a hammer is also it's how it's weighted. That the head is heavier than the body. And so I asked them to think of virtues that they feel or think are innate to them, that they were born with. And the question is, are you cultivating those virtues in order to fulfill your purpose? So they had to, I asked them to buy into the premise that you're all, we are all individually created to serve particular purposes. For example, since I was born, people have said that I am patient and compassionate. My whole family believes that. And so I asked the students, okay, what have people who've known you your entire life said about you? And so one student raised his hand and says, my mom and my grandma and everyone has said, since I was a baby, I've always been the person who helped others or who was willing to share his toys. And then I said, okay, well, how many of you were willing to share your toys? Not many other people. So it's a rare virtue. And so the question is, is that virtue something that you have cultivated that might be a road sign to a purpose, a calling in your life? Perhaps you're going to go into a profession where you're helping others. Uh, sure enough, I'm in a profession where patience is absolutely necessary. Compassion is absolutely necessary. And so they each came up with three virtues, and I gave them a Jenga block. And this isn't the miniature Jenga, this is the big one, the big blocks. And each of them came to the front and built the tower. And so we looked at this tower of 45 blocks. And I used a scripture um, from Psalms 139, verses 13 and 14, it says, For you knit me in my mother's womb, you created my inmost being, and I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And so I said, okay, we're all wonderfully made. We were all knit in our mother's wombs. There are particular virtues that were knit in us at birth. And they're wonderful. And so I kept gesturing to the tower. Look at this tower full of virtues. Imagine it's one person. And surely all of us, we have more than three. And I said, on the one hand, I want you to think of it as one person. And on the other hand, I want you to think of it as a group of people like us. We are all a team, a team of leaders. Or it could be your athletic team, or it could be your family, it could be your executive board. Uh, we're often involved in bodies of people. So if they're individual bodies or individual people that make up a body, then I pulled out one block and I said, this is Janiah. And I tossed it to the side. Janiah is no longer part of this body because of what someone else in that group said to her or made her do that basically offended her, disrespected her, made her feel like an outcast. And now she's no longer a part of this tower, this body, but also with her go the virtues that she brought, the talents, the gifts that were unique to her that this body needed in order to really be more efficient so we also need to be thinking about how to honor one another, how to encourage one another, how to help each individual person to cultivate and strengthen those virtues so that we all can reach this common goal of success or effectiveness together. But it means knowing one another, appreciating what we all bring individually to the table. And then I use the other example of, okay, imagine this tower is just you. We are made up of virtues and values values being the beliefs that we've, you know, appropriated that we've learned from parents, friends, culture. And I pulled out another block and I pulled out another block and I said, this is when I lied. This is when I cheated. This is when I drank too much, you know, and I just kept pulling them out. And so they could see the holes in the tower. And I said, a lot of us, we continue to compromise these virtues and values, but we're still standing. And we think that we're whole. We think that we're okay. We think that we're stable enough because we're still standing. But this is the facade that we portray to people. They can't see these holes, these voids in ourselves. 
And all it takes is a shaking of the table and that tower comes falling down. But some of us think that, oh, and a guy raises his hand, don't we feel those things, those spaces with things? And I was like, yes, those things tend to be vices, unhealthy coping mechanisms. And they give us, again, the false impression that, oh, I'm stable because I see it now as a whole tower, as a whole self. It's just a more fragile facade. Some people don't realize like what they're supposed to do. It almost seems like we should look and say, ask ourselves kind of what do people always tell me that I'm good at, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You hear it over and over again, and sometimes you dismiss that stuff, and you're like, oh, that's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. If somebody says you're a good communicator, or you're funny, or you're whatever, people just kind of brush that off, and they're like, sure. Mm -hmm. But maybe like sit down and realize, what do the people always tell me I'm good at? And then combine that with what you love to do, and say, if I could combine my natural talent with what I love... What could I aim for? If we could try to aim for that thing or try a few things maybe that might fit those descriptions that we may start to feel more whole. Because sometimes yes. it almost seems like things are going fine technically, mm -hmm. but you still don't feel You're like, why don't I feel like I'm successful yet? Why don't I feel complete? And so to address that, I, I, I went back to the hammer. So imagine a hammer is banging this nail in and it's just, it's easy. It's efficient. And that's the feeling we want to experience when we're doing something that we feel like we're made to do. It's going to be natural. We don't have to try hard. For me, it's writing. It's not math. Math, I'm deathly afraid of. It's not a virtue. My brain shuts down. Yeah. So I'm not, I don't feel like I'm made to do that. Now, a hammer, when it's efficiently, productively, doing what it's created to do, it doesn't feel anything. We, however, do. So imagine... I'm doing something that I'm really good at doing, but I still don't feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I still don't, as you were saying, you're trying to meet the crossroads of I'm good at it and I feel passionate about it. Well, what if the sort of hammer in us doesn't feel passionate about banging nails? There's something else. And that is a more difficult question to answer. That's when you get real confused. That's when you get really confused. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? Well... That book that I recommended to you a while back, Letters to a Young Poet. I read it. It's lovely. And you said you highlighted a lot of it. I did. It was very um, encouraging, maybe is a good word for it. It's just very relatable and not something that I think most people have ever heard about. Mm -hmm. And so he challenges the young writer to, to do what we're talking about. He comes from a military family. He graduated from a military academy with high marks. And so it looks like that's what he's supposed to do, and he'll be good at it. But his heart, his passion, was in something that he felt a lot more insecure about, and that was writing poetry. And so I love that Rilke doesn't tell him, oh, then follow your heart, that old cliche. He really suggests quite beautifully to begin that long, arduous journey of searching yourself, introspecting, knowing yourself, and going to the recesses of childhood going to those dark places and sitting with those emotions mm. and kind of leaning into the discomfort yes and then there's some answers or more questions and he has a beautiful quote that even when we run into more questions that's a beautiful discovery you're opening up new pathways for yourself i think mm. that's why i found the stoic philosophy is really interesting especially like a ryan holiday's book uh, the obstacle is the way but it's about how you lean into the resistance the War of Art also talks about the concept of resistance. Mm. If you say like, man, I really want to be a writer, but everything I write sucks and your mind's telling you all this stuff and it's hard to write and I don't always have a good idea and whatever and you're just judging yourself every step of the way. But instead of listening to that resistance, you just force yourself every day. If this is what I want or this is what I'm passionate about, I will sit down and I will do the work of sitting there and writing even if I think it sucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because eventually you kind of push past that, you kind of hit a flow and you can and you get into a groove, but you have to sit down and put in the time to go through the uncomfortable part. We have the ability to lead very comfortable lives now, and mm -hmm. it almost leads you to this complacency. Yeah. And that sense of where everything's kind of easy and normal can put you in a depression. It's almost like you might almost crave that struggle or trying to do something or working past a problem. So mm -hmm. it's good to find out what those things are for yourself and try to work past them. And, and that's why I think this 
topic and that approach is absolutely necessary for this generation of millennials and the new iGen generation because they don't seem prepared to deal with difficult situations. So I, I give my students a hard time when they say, oh, that's awkward. And they try to skirt the issue, try to circumnavigate that topic. You know, they don't want to talk about it. And it's like, no, 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 no. This enabling and pampering history that you have is making you less capable of overcoming these obstacles there and, and, and facing these difficult situations and overcoming them because you just wait for someone else to do it for you. Instead of going around it, maybe just try to go through it. Through it. But they don't have the skills, a lot of them, and it's really sad. Yeah, I didn't for a long time. I'm not mm. perfect at it, but I do try to, because I always describe myself as an extroverted introvert. Mm. I'm very, for me, when sometimes people say, well, you say you're shy, but you do this and that, or even this podcast or whatever, mm. Mm -hmm. how do you do that? And I'm like, well, it's not that I'm perfectly comfortable. I'm just making myself do it because that makes me stronger. And I think it helps me in other avenues of life. So someone will say, you got to push through that stuff. So I'm going to ask you what other avenues does it help you with when you trudge through and you get through? It gives me a stronger sense of self, mm. I think. Mm -hmm. It helps me to believe in myself so that when I am in new situations, I can trust myself like, well, you'll get through it. Or if things don't go perfect because I have a history of being a perfectionist in my mind and judging myself for that. I'm mm. saying like, you don't have to be perfect. You're just good for you for getting through it. Mm -hmm. You faced it. At least you showed up. And you did the best that you could, and that's the only part that you can control. I will do the best that I can in whatever state I'm in. I'm going to at least do that. And whatever other outcomes, people's reactions or outside uh, events, those are not in my control. And if they don't go perfectly, everything's still going to be okay. Like, the dawn will break. Yeah. Like, the next yeah. day will come. And I'll have another chance. And if something's not perfect, I'll learn from it. And so it's almost a process of just like not taking things too seriously, but mm -hmm. just, you know, coming with the best that you can. And I think it's that you just realize that you can get through them and it doesn't all have to be so dire. Yeah. And I also, this is kind of an interesting thing, is that I was so afraid of vulnerability, right? But then I asked myself during the process of this journaling, and writing some of the posts that I wrote on my blog. I was like, what makes me attracted to other people? And attract, not just like, you know, relationship attracted, but just friends, just what human beings attract me. And it's people that are real, honest, open, mm. and they're willing to share their imperfection with you. Because mm. you feel innately more comfortable with them because they seem like real people. Yeah. That you can open up to as well. And I said, well, if that's the kind of people you like to be around, why are you doing everything in your power to not be that? Mm, that's a really great breakthrough mm -hmm. because a lot of people are. And again, I, I don't like to knock this generation because I really care about them so much. I have, a, I have a heart for them. But with the social media tools that people have now, they really want to perpetuate that perfect facade. You know. I've fallen prey to it several times of Me course too. yeah it's it's hard mm -hmm. it's irresistible you know after i gave that and by the way today is the one year anniversary of that know yourself video oh so convenient it's interesting that i'm now being forced by you to reflect on it again i apologize <laughs> but also to sort of track my progress like what what have i done differently or what new experiences have i sort of put myself into to challenge myself uh, or what pitfalls have did I continue to fall into? Did I open up more to my friends after that? Or did I fall back into what we're now talking about? And that is, oh, just posting the happy things on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, or snapping just when the dish turned out wonderfully. Not stop, not snapping the, the failures. I need to get better at that. And even next month I have a, a wedding that I'm going to in Joshua Tree. And I've never been to Joshua Tree. Now, Joshua Tree was on my top three places to go 11 years ago when I moved to San Diego. And, and I'm now wondering, doing. but it's because of a wedding. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, what was stopping me before? Well, it's the fear of the desert and camping. 
Oh, you fear the, why do you fear the desert and camping? You know, because I think because I, I like being, I like the comforts. I, I'm more of a glamper than a camper. Yes, yeah, so you fear dehydration. Yeah. You fear, <laughs> you fear sweating. What are you? Yeah. Scorpions, <laughs> sure. you know. I've only been camping twice. Let's be honest with ourselves. And for the first one was one day and the second one was two days. <laughs> so it's not advanced camping by any means. But I do find that I really enjoy being back. I love nature. And I'm a little bit of a germaphobe, and same, same. a lot of people assume that because I'm a little bit of a germaphobe that I must hate like nature and dirt and whatever. I like that better. It's people germs that worry me. Like <laughs> I don't mind nature at all. If anything, when I've gone camping or it just if I'm outside, if I take the time to go outside, God, I feel like I, I hit a reset button. Right. It's nice to calm down. It's nice to separate from the connection to the phones all the time and. You know, the last camping trip we went on, we didn't have reception at all. I almost wrote a blog post that's still sitting in my drafts called The Gift of No Reception. Mm, yes. <laughs> because it, it took me kind of, I don't know, to this more basic place, to this quieter, slower place where I didn't feel like I had to talk to people and answer things and whatever. I could just kind of sit and, and be. The symbol of that place is like what we were discussing earlier, the leaning into the the uncomfortable or into the unknown yet it's full of things that we know that we like you said fresh air nature and it's just ironic like why haven't we gone what's stopping us and is it is it really the wi-fi yeah. <laughs> is, <laughs> is it know. really the germs you know what is it about and it's worth journaling yeah what really i mean it's not that far away it's like Two and a half hours. I've been to the Grand Canyon. I mean, there's like certain things that have been on my list for a while. I think it's more that I just haven't made the concrete plans. I think sometimes you just have to like plan it. It's done. It's set. You're going. Well, that's what I've realized with some, certain things, you know, and uh, the, me and my friend Michelle, we went to New York for the first time ever, like two a year, two years ago. I'm starting to lose track of time, but we'd never been mm. our whole lives. And we were sitting on this, this couch right here. And we were both talking about it, just like, hey, I've never been to New York. I wish we could go. And then we were just like, let's go. Yeah. Let's do it. And that's a big and adventure. We, that's a long ways away. And we booked flights in that moment. We just booked flights. And now, guess what? You're going. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I feel like sometimes maybe that's, that's what it takes. Is she like a challenger for you? Because then in that moment, that's, that's what she did. Yes, I think that. we bounce off of each other mm. very well. And we're good at kind of creating that, the momentum. And that's why I want to validate you by saying, you know, earlier you were saying there might be three people that occupy the six roles. And I'm all about quality over quantity. So that's fine if there's three that fulfill those six roles. Because as you were saying, they could be just great life-giving people who are honest and care deeply about you and know you really, really well and are invested in your betterment that, hey, those three are just the core members. Sometimes I think that's how it works out. Mm -hmm. More power to people, they got more people, but. <laughs> True, right. <laughs> those are the extroverts. You know? Those yes, and it's just not me. Yeah. I think I can fake being an extrovert, but it, it drains it me drains of the energy. You. What were we talking about also before? Oh, you, you asked about meditating. Yes, and you said you do. So I meditate and I also pray. Uh, and have my favorite places in San Diego, one of which is uh, Torrey Pines. But it's not where the hiking takes place. As you go a little bit north, uh, there's a tiny little, I want to call it a park. It has a couple of benches. And it also has this tree that an artist a couple of years ago carved out of the trunk of the tree, a seat. It's called Sunset Seat. And it faces the ocean there. And the tree sort of curves parallel to the ground. And then it turns upward and he carved a like a three foot tall i think it's a hawk or an eagle a bird and it's beautiful so that's one of the spaces that i like to go to and another would be coronado and it reminds me of where i grew up on an island in texas and then another is this um is right behind the international peace and justice building at usd which overlooks a cliff cliffs and water mm -hmm. very peaceful my, very peaceful so those are places where i go to Meditate, journal, pray. That's nice. I'm away. doing it wrong. I'm just sitting in my house. But you like nature. I do. Gotta, I do. You gotta, you, when we're in a, Courtney, find a city, most beautiful city. We got. It's a lovely city. We got places. Yeah. I take long walks 
but I don't ever like sit and try to meditate out and about. This is key. Yeah. I think this is what 2018 is calling for you to do. <laughs> <laughs> Find your nature outdoor meditating places. Yes, that would be fun. I mean, in this city, especially. Yeah, I'm thinking Sunset Cliffs right now. That was my mm. first was my first instinct. Yeah. But it's really interesting because I feel like if you bring up meditation to a lot of people, they go, oh, I can't, I can't do that. I can't do that. I'm not good at it. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to shut my mind down. And I'm mm-hmm. like, well, it's not shutting your mind down. It's trying to create space. Thoughts come in and out. You acknowledge them. You let them go. Mm-hmm. You try to return yourself what back to the breath. But it allows you an awareness of kind of the thoughts that come into your mind when mm-hmm. you're sitting there. And uh, when I've talked to a lot of people about it and they say they can't do it or whatever, and I say, well, why can't you do it? And they're like, I just don't want to, I don't even want to see what comes up. There's a lot of fear with that. Yeah. Because if you shut the TV off and you shut all the external off, where does your mind go? Absolutely. I totally agree. You're going to have to hear those demons. You're going to have to hear those haunting thoughts. They get louder because all we're trying to do is shut out, drown them out with other superficial stuff. For sure. I do it too. We're good at it. We are because we're just trying to make it through day to day and be the most comfortable that we can possibly be. Mm -hmm. But I think what's nice about it is if you force yourself to do it and you force yourself to look at it, then you can say, well, how do I fix it? How do I get past it? But you also like, I think the more you push yourself into that uncomfortable feeling of addressing those things, you you become more desensitized to it so that you're able to address that and think of it as like, oh, how interesting. It becomes like a a curiosity of yourself rather than something that is upsetting. And it's, you get to release the fear of that because I feel like a lot of us exist with a great deal of fear at the root of a lot of things. Absolutely. Right. It Mm -hmm. stops us from doing things. It, it really affects a lot of the choices that we make during the day. Absolutely. Do you run into that? Yes. And, um, how do you get past fear? Ooh, that's a big old question. That's a big one. I might have to swig at this Jameson real quick here. It's <laughs> a big question. It is. You know, I'll go back to the movie Inside Out because that's one of the five emotions. One thing that I've realized is that um, there's good fear and then there's, there, there's sabotaging fear. Especially after that talk, uh, I've tried to do a little bit better job of... And, and that vulnerability and fear, they're connected. Uh, allowing yourself to be perhaps overcome by that monstrous fear makes you vulnerable. So you put yourself in a position where, oh, I don't feel comfortable. I'm going to let this sort of happen to me let this emotion overcome me. And again, for me, writing about it is essential. Just getting the words down on paper already gives me some relief just by naming it. Mm-hmm. And again, by just by circumscribing it in letters, whatever that fear is, just, just write it down. And again, by hand is is a lot more powerful because that instrument is now like a sword. And then I'm able to sort of create something out of that where, again, I'm in control. And when I encounter it in real life, you're like, oh, oh, it's that person or it's that conversation. I'm that much more prepared with something to say or or at least a posture to assume when I know that it's going to be uncomfortable and I might feel weak, but at least I have an approach. I have a strategy. I have a foot ahead and I'm not just crouching or cowering. I have a stance that makes me feel just a little bit more confident. So it's, it's oftentimes, again, things from childhood. Sometimes we're not aware of how much we really are holding on to so much from those, from those times so much, but it's good to look at it. Mm -hmm. Like if you really want to kind of open up and break those patterns, you got to look it in the face a little bit. Yes. Yes. We've all got things. That's the other thing too, is I'm like, but nobody's perfect. Everybody's got stuff. Yeah. Even people that seem perfect, it's because they're good at portraying perfect. And right? you know, when you invite you invite more authentic people into your life, the more vulnerable you are. And exactly, because those people get it. Yeah. And they're doing it. They're on the same kind of path mentally that you are. And sometimes they end up teaching you something that you didn't, whoa. And your life is more messed up than mine. How did you just help me with that thing? And then that's, and that ends up being a gift from the universe. You opened up and that person's life that you could have been judging Mm -hmm. is actually that ends up being the person with an answer. Everybody's got something they can teach you. Yes. Even if they're not, you know, necessarily 
your best friends or people that you want to have around you all the time. I feel like I do feel like everybody that kind of comes into your into your zone is there for a purpose for you to learn. Yeah. Even if it's not a perfect encounter, (laughs) it's not a maybe it's not the best encounter, but there's something you can learn from them and to stop taking things so personally. Yeah. So if, it's like if we all look at each other like they're doing the best they can, there's something that causes them to do that and just be a little bit more forgiving, I think. Mm-hmm. I think we'd all have better interaction. And that's why if you practice meditation or you practice mindfulness, you can develop uh, a greater degree of self-compassion. And so back to what we were talking about, where you where you sit with those difficult emotions, those challenging memories, and you just kind of hug your eight-year-old self and say, okay, now... I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm more mature now. I've seen more things. I've experienced a lot. And I can share a little bit of comfort and wisdom with you. And by cultivating that, by looking at 12-year-old and 14-year-old, you know, just, just on and on in your life, you're better able to feel more com- or act out compassionately towards other people. And that's beautiful. That's powerful. Yeah. It would make a big difference in daily interactions altogether. Mm-hmm. So what else you got? What else do you share with your with your students? All of your wisdom. Oh man, you're trying to make me feel like I'm old. <laughs> um, no, but you're a professor. You teach. <laughs> I do like to talk about rhetoric. I, I have to say, people they're they're always afraid of the class writing. Oh my gosh, it, it, you know, when I was a grad student, they always did this survey, or they shared with us the results of the survey of um, a freshman top three things that you're most afraid of. Another theme we've had here, fear. Number one is um, dying, tied with being tied with being raped. And then number two, writing. Number three, public speaking. Public speaking, yeah. Everybody so, seems to be scared of that one. Yeah. So death, writing, public speaking. I'm like, wow. These- writing, I think it's funny that writing is scary to people. It's scary. Public speaking, I totally get. Mm-hmm. It's nerve wracking. Everybody's staring at you. It's your own voice. It's your own words. You're nervous. You're in front of them. It's live. Yes. Right? Yes. So that's a little bit scarier. I get that. I've felt that. I've been in jobs where I've had to do it all day. As Mm. a shy person, I went to jobs where I had to public speak all day. Wow. And got more accustomed to speaking on a microphone and just in front of large groups of people to the point where you desensitize yourself to it. But it's about you have to do it. Mm. Just acting comfortable Mm -hmm. in hopes that it would be comfortable eventually and through repetition it became comfortable if if i have to speak publicly now i still get a little bit nervous but i kind of resort back to that it's almost like a little bit of a mental and muscle memory mm-hmm. to those times where i had to do it every single day and it was stressful I'm not saying it was not it was not comfortable <laughs> <laughs> but you you realize if you do anything enough times that it's fine and nothing bad happens you say the wrong thing you just correct yourself and guess what most people aren't paying that much attention <laughs> and you'll move past it and you'll be fine. But it's interesting that public speaking is a scary thing. Now, writing, on the other hand, that was my safe place because I could choose to not share that. That could just be personal. And then you have the chance to edit. It yes. shouldn't be scary. Everybody should feel comfortable <laughs> doing that. Right? Yeah. It's just that K through 12 experience that just traumatized the <laughs> red ink. The red ink. The marginal comments. Yes. Be humiliated. <laughs> to be shamed. It's not good that people are shamed for those types of things. Not at all. So I avoid the color red. I use blue or I use black or use green. That's polite of you. (laughs) Still the same shaming words. Yeah. Like that's a really stupid thing to say or you're an idiot. I still say the same things. (laughs) No, But I say it in blue ink. (laughs) I say it in blue ink. Yes. Takes off the... So how do people move past these things? Do they just face them? You write more often. So we do a lot of free writing. I say, don't worry about the grammar, don't worry about the spelling, just really let it be a free flow. And to write different, explore different topics, you know, just sort of see where it goes. Uh, Don't worry about me looking at it, don't worry about a peer looking at it. Um, Just appreciate the creativity of your mind, or even the lack of creativity of your mind. Maybe you're saying the same thing over and over again. Well, if you are, there's some substance in that. There's a reason why. Maybe you're fixated on that for a reason that you need to think about. So uh, instead of demoralizing ourselves or, you know, delving into self-deprecation, it's just, it's unhealthy. But just to appreciate 
what comes out. We really try to remove a lot of the the refuse of K through twelve trauma uh, from the writing experience, and it helps. We also do a lot of activities where they're autobiographical. Like again, the whole know yourself. That's my favorite thing to talk about. And I give them a lot of personal examples about how, again, rhetoric is essential to everything that we do. You know, again, they use they think of the term of rhetoric as, you know, that's a bunch of rhetoric. That's a bunch of BS. When it's still the oldest uh, subject taught since the beginning of civilization and, and for many good reasons. I'll never forget the time that I, you know, I give my same sort of introductory spiel to rhetoric for about an hour and then one kid at the end of the class, he waited until everybody else left. And he said, this is Dr. Menifee, can I ask you a personal question? I was like, well, you know, we'd, come on now. Like how personal, how sir? How personal are we talking to? <laughs> he says, it's about me. No worries, it's not about you. I was like, still. <laughs> he says, well, um, I just want to know, can I use rhetoric on my girlfriend? Hmm. I was like, you, you already did. You convinced her that you're trustworthy and you persuaded her to be, you know, her uh, her boyfriend so what's going on he says well now i want her to be my wife and i think i need rhetoric i was like you're absolutely right you do so then he whips out a draft of a poem and a draft of a marriage proposal and he hands them to me and he says would you rhetorically analyze them please so i could see the wheels turning in his head that he understands that the words are meaningful they have the power to convince they have the power to persuade but what he didn't catch was it's audience centric. You know, I might know a lot about women, but I don't know his girlfriend. Right. And so when I, I said, oh, okay, well, I'm going to look at this poem. And I said, what if I don't like lilies? And I'm going to say, oh, that's a cheesy flower. And I exit out. And I said, it's cliche. And then you say, oh, well, that's her favorite flower. And I said, well, see, now you realize I'm not the best, most qualified person to rhetorically analyze your poem to your girlfriend is that it's still you. And so that was an important lesson for him to learn that it's still about the specific audience. You can't just generalize and say, this poem would be relevant for any old girl or, I, or that I would be able to rhetorically analyze any poem to any person. And over the course of the semester, he worked on those two documents and he did use them to propose to her. And that was probably about seven years ago and they're married. It is very interesting to think every time you sit down and write something, if it's something that you plan on sharing with people, who am I talking to? What is the best way to communicate whatever I'm trying to communicate to those people? Mm -hmm. Which is what makes, I guess, effective movies and yes. books and all that kind yes. of stuff because you know your audience. And that's one of the powerful things about writing. And it's so basic, but people just don't think about it. A lot of people assume they're not good at it. Yeah. Or they can't. Or they don't want to take the time to get to know the audience. And also sometimes I feel like just reading a lot helps. If you read a lot of books, all of a sudden your vocabulary expands and it becomes instinctual, like what a good sentence is. Or mm -hmm. and you read things with more colorful language and you are able to build more descriptive sentences just because you spend a lot of time reading descriptive sentences. Mm -hmm. And knowing, again, who that audience is, that's reading like who the target audience is yeah for sure because if they don't like descriptive language or flowery language then then you're done you're done <laughs> <laughs> so what are a couple books you would suggest people read oh the one that i told you the letters to a young poet is still deliciously beautiful and you know just so wise very compassionate i call it a life-giving text Oh, that's interesting. That's great. And what's the one that you suggested I read? Mind over... Oh, that one. Mind over mood. Changing the way you feel by changing how you think. Uh, it's based on cognitive behavioral therapy. And uh, it helps you to, again, identify uh, circumstances that trigger certain thoughts, emotions, and behaviors. And then come up with strategies or coping mechanisms to deal better with them, more effectively with them, because you're probably going to encounter those circumstances again, like taking a test or going on a first date, uh, whatever it is. That's great. Well, I think we're good. Oh, all right. We're good. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sitting and chatting with me. This was wonderful. That's it for this one, people. Make sure to follow me on the socials at Courtney Diamond for updates on new podcasts and head over to CourtneyDiamond.com to check out the blog. 
Thanks for being here. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, please leave a nice rating or comment on iTunes. I would very much appreciate it. Hope you have an amazing day and I'll talk to you guys soon.